In this lecture, we're going to talk about reaction forces and objects in equilibrium. So the main goal is to determine the reaction forces acting on an object such that it's in a state of static equilibrium. So the first thing to think about is this term, static equilibrium. Now we've already come across the idea of equilibrium when discussing Newton's laws of motion. And we said that if all the forces acting on an object were in balance, well then the object was in a state of equilibrium. Now, this definition is, is, is a little bit too broad for us because this implies that an object can be moving with a constant velocity and still be in a state of equilibrium because all forces acting on it are in balance. In this course on statics, we want to confine ourselves to the study of objects in a state of static equilibrium. So that means that the object is in equilibrium with all forces acting on it in balance, but it's also not moving, okay? Hence the term static equilibrium. It's also worth reminding ourselves at this stage that we did say early on we only want to consider two-dimensional problems, and this is still the case. We do this because many engineering problems can be readily simplified from three dimensions down into two dimensions. It simplifies the mathematics involved, but we don't lose too much accuracy, generally speaking, when we do this. So for a 2D object in a state of static equilibrium, two conditions must be satisfied. The sum of all forces on the object must be zero, and the sum of all moments on the object must be zero. As we've seen, the common practice is to consider forces parallel and perpendicular to a Cartesian coordinate system, resulting in orthogonal force components. So our three equations of static equilibrium become the sum of the forces horizontally, vertically, and the sum of the moments about any point must equal zero. This effectively imposes the conditions that our structure will not move horizontally or vertically and will not rotate. These three equations of 2D static equilibrium are a very helpful tool when analysing simple structures. According to Newton's third law, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now we commonly encounter reactions uh, at the locations where an object or a mass is supported. Now the simplest example of this is as I stand on the ground here, my body weight is exerting a force through my feet onto the ground. Now the ground in return has to support me or has to exert a reaction force back up onto me. Now this is true for any structure or part of a structure in a state of static equilibrium. At the point of support, reaction forces and sometimes reaction moments have to be generated to counteract or balance the externally applied forces or moments. And this is necessary to keep the object or mass in a state of static equilibrium because remember, if the forces acting on an object or a mass are not in equilibrium, that mass will be moving, it will be accelerating. When analysing real world structures, one of the biggest uncertainties arises from not knowing how the actual supports for our structure are going to behave. So to try and cope with this variability in real world supports, what we tend to do is say that a support is gonna behave in one of three different ways. Now these three different idealised support conditions or models that we use to characterise real world supports allow us to generate different combinations of reactions. And also, crucially, they allow different types of movement at the support, and that has really important implications for structural stability. Now, when we model a support, uh, when we say use a pin support or a fixed support or a roller support in our analysis, what we're saying is that these idealized supports are approximating the real world behavior. We're not saying that the real world structural support is going to behave exactly like a pin or a roller or a fixed support. We're just making an approximation and it's really important that you understand this distinction between idealized support conditions and what actually happens in the real world on the structure. So before we get into that, let's just consider each one of these idealized supports, the roller, the pin and the fixed support in a little bit more detail. A roller support provides resistance to forces in one direction only. In other words, movement in one direction is completely restricted, while movement in the orthogonal direction is permitted. This support always allows rotation. This means that no reaction moment can be generated by this type of support. In reality, roller supports are often employed where a structure must be supported vertically, for example, but movement mustn't be restricted horizontally. For example, steel bridges can expand in the heat of the sun. This expansion of the steel can cause the bridge to get slightly longer during the day before contracting again in the cooler nighttime temperatures. If this thermal movement is restricted, additional stresses will build up within the structure. To overcome this, engineers often use roller supports at one end of the bridge. 
allowing it to move as the bridge expands and contracts. A pin support is similar to a roller in that it restricts vertical movement of the structure by supplying a vertical reaction. It also allows free rotation, just like a roller support, so no reaction moment can be generated. However, unlike a roller support, pin supports also restrict horizontal movement and therefore can generate a horizontal reaction. You can think of pin supports as behaving just like hinges, restricting linear motion but allowing rotation. It's important to appreciate the potential difference between the theoretical behaviour of a support and the behaviour of the real world structure. In theory, we've said that a pin support provides absolutely no resistance to rotation. However, the corresponding real world supports often do provide some resistance to rotation. A typical example where this situation arises is in the analysis and design of steel frame buildings. Consider a steel beam supported between two columns. This beam is bolted at each end to a steel plate called a fin plate welded to each column. Although it would appear that no rotation can occur at this joint, beams in this situation are often modelled as having a combination of a pin and roller support. The key is that when the structure is under load, sufficient rotation can occur at the joint to justify the free rotation assumption. Remember, in reality, the magnitude of the flexions and rotations tend to be quite small, so a large degree of rotation at the support is not necessarily required for us to justifiably model a support as a pin support. In fact, the gap between the end of the beam and the face of the column is provided specifically to allow the beam to rotate relative to the column. A fixed support provides resistance to both linear and rotational movement and therefore can develop a vertical and horizontal reaction force as well as a moment reaction. The classic example of a structure which utilises a fixed support is the cantilever beam. Notice that only one fixed support is required to ensure that this beam remains in a state of static equilibrium. In response to an applied force, vertical and horizontal force reactions are developed. Pause the video and think for a minute or two why the reaction moment is required and what would happen if it were not developed. Remember, if no reaction moment were developed, the support would in fact be a pin support. The vertical component of the applied force P actually generates a moment about the support. The distance between the support and the applied force provides a lever arm for the vertical component of the applied force to generate a moment. A reaction moment is required to resist the applied moment, otherwise the beam would simply rotate clockwise about the support as if a pin support were provided. So to recap, all three support conditions can resist force in at least one direction. In the case of a roller support, it can only resist force in one direction. But the pin and fixed support can resist forces in any direction, and so this can be represented by developing separate support reactions in two orthogonal directions. The fixed support is the only support that can resist any movement, linear or rotational, as it can develop a moment reaction. You're going to become very familiar with the characteristics of these support conditions as we progress through our study of statics. Just remember, they're idealized models of real world conditions and therefore offer an approximation of real world behavior only. If you're still a little unclear about the behavior and characteristics of these support conditions, the best way to clear things up is by thinking about the effect of their behavior on a simple beam. So with that said, imagine a simple beam currently with no supports. The only force currently acting on this beam is its own self-weight, let's call that W, and assume it behaves like a point load acting at the centre of the beam. Without any supports, the beam will accelerate in the direction of the force and obviously not be in a state of static equilibrium. However, if we provide a roller support at each end of the beam, the force W can be resisted by the vertical reactions developed at the supports. However, while this arrangement is technically in a state of static equilibrium, as all forces are balanced, it's unstable. Can you think why? There's no resistance to any horizontal forces. Therefore, if a horizontal force was applied to the beam, no matter how small, the beam would accelerate laterally in the direction of the force. Therefore, a stable configuration would require one of the roller supports to be replaced by a pin support. Note, however, that although we now have a pin support, there is no horizontal reaction. This is a key yet subtle point the pin support has the ability to generate a horizontal reaction, but if no horizontal force is directly applied, no horizontal reaction will be generated. Remember, reactions are only generated in response to externally applied forces. If none are applied, you can think of the reactions as sitting in reserve, 
waiting to be called upon if an external force is applied. So if an external force is applied that contains a horizontal component, then the pin support will generate a horizontal reaction stopping the beam rolling away. We've already discussed the behaviour of the beam supported by a fixed support. The three reactions generated are capable of maintaining the beam in a state of static equilibrium. A particular issue arises if there are any more supports provided to the beam. For example, if a roller support is provided at the opposite end of the beam, the structure becomes known as a propped cantilever. This greatly improves the structural performance of the beam by reducing the amount the beam will deflect on the load, but it presents us with a challenge from an analysis point of view. Can you think what this might be? We'll be discussing this issue in the next couple of lectures. In this lecture, we've introduced the principle of static equilibrium and discussed the importance of support reactions in maintaining a state of static equilibrium. We've also introduced the three commonly used idealized support models and discussed their features and how they relate to the real world counterparts. The next task is to use the principle of static equilibrium to analyze structures and determine the magnitudes of their support reactions. This task is so fundamental to structural analysis that we'll dedicate the next lecture to working through some examples.